by baskets full of these beans. And he got where he couldn't harvest them anymore. So those youngins would go and harvest the beans for their grandfather. And uh, they took that name, the, the uh, purple holes, that's what they call themselves. I told my doctor that I broke my arm in two places. And he said, stop going to those places. <laughs> Actually, I went to the doctor with a suspicious looking mole. And he said, they all look like that. I should have left it in the garden. I gave up my seat up to an elderly person on the bus. And that's how I lost my job as a bus driver. <laughs> We have a candidate for president who says we're not going back. They were chanting that at one of the rare rallies that they had. But sometimes you have to go back. This sermon is going back. The sermon is uh, fat-free, gluten-free, but it may not be socially acceptable. Do you care? No. <laughs> Joel chapter 2 and 13. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. That's going back. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love when he relents from sending calamity. In Jeremiah 7, 23. But I gave them this command, Obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you that it may go well with you. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to just gather around your table and feast on your word this morning, Lord. And I just pray that you will guide and direct this word to right where you want it to go and it will have the effect that you want it to have. Ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Abraham was called out of a culture of idolatry. And he traveled where God led him. He was in the land of Canaan for some time, and a drought came and threatened their existence there, so he moved to Egypt. I don't see in the Bible where God called him to go to Egypt, but he decided to go there. And he got in trouble down there with a the Pharaoh, as you know the story, and he had to leave Egypt. He got kicked out of there. Genesis chapter 13, first four verses. So Abram, that's how he was known at that time, Abram, went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and in gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier. So Abraham went back to where he was when he was in God's will. It wasn't God's will for him to go to Egypt. He had to go back. Sometimes you just have to go back. And where and where he had that was where he had first built an altar. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord in verse 4. So he went back to God. He was out of God's will when he went to Egypt. And he went back. Have you ever been there? I have. There are times when you have to go back. Fast forward to Moses. Grew up in Pharaoh's palace. And he murdered a guy. You know the story. He ran away from Egypt as a fugitive. And we find him as a shepherd, living a comfortable life, minding his father-in-law's sheep. And God called him out of a burning bush. And he was being called to lead the Israelites out of slavery of Egypt. At first, he resisted the call. He made some excuses going back to Egypt wasn't something that he wanted to do, but he relented and with God's help, the nation of Israel came out of bondage in Egypt 
and began the journey towards the promised land in order to accomplish the task Moses had to do what he had to go back sometimes you have to go back when King Solomon died his son Rehoboam succeeded him as king but there was division among God's people and Jeroboam the son of Nebat led the northern ten tribes away from Jerusalem Jeroboam started as a servant of Solomon because he was a talented worker so Solomon put him in charge of his labor force and a prophet told Jeroboam that he would be king over Israel at some point Jeroboam fled from Solomon I think probably because Solomon heard about that prophecy and it was a threat to him so he fled from Solomon to Egypt but when Rehoboam Solomon's son, if you can keep track of these names, went to Shechem to be installed as king of Israel. Jeroboam returned. The people sent Jeroboam to the new king to ask him to lighten the heavy load of labor and taxes that Solomon had laid on them. Remember, Jeroboam had been an official in charge of labor, so they thought maybe that would help. The older advisors gave King Rehoboam, that's Solomon's son, the wise counsel to honor people's requests and thus to win their loyalty. This is all in 1 Kings chapter 12 and 2 Chronicles chapter 10. King Rehoboam asked the young men who had grown up with him for advice as well, and they foolishly told the new king to threaten even harsher conditions. I think if you look at the accounts you'll see that he said to them my waist is thicker than my father's my th wrist is thicker than my father's waist and he scourged you with whips and I will come after you or scourge you with scorpions is what he told them threatening and so uh, the people rebelled abandoning the house of David who was Solomon's father and uh, Rehoboam's grandfather and ultimately making Jeroboam their king. So Rehoboam fled to Jerusalem where he mustered an army, but Shemaiah, a prophet of God, delivered God's message to Rehoboam. The troops should go home because the divided kingdom had come from the Lord. The people of Judah wisely listened and did not invade Israel. There was the southern two kingdoms, that's called Judah, which was the kingdom of Judah and Benjamin, and the northern ten tribes all went with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Uh, if you don't know these stories, they're, they're very fascinating. So there continued to be warfare between Jeroboam and uh, Rehoboam throughout Rehoboam's reign. Jeroboam had been promised great blessings, and a continuing dynasty if he would follow the Lord. However, he did not obey the Lord. Instead, he had two golden calves made for the people to worship in the northern kingdom and made priests and celebrations for these golden calves. That was the idolatry, often referred to as the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, in later chapters of 1 and 2 Kings. So after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. This is in 1 Kings chapter 12. And he said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And that was a blasphemous thing to do and to say. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. The ten tribes were then known as Israel while the two southern tribes were known as Judea. There was warfare between these two nations even though they were all Jewish people. 
And they both rebelled, both of them, against God. They needed to go back. They needed to go back. They needed to return to the God of their fathers. They needed to go back. Ahab, Ahab was the seventh king of the northern tribe, the northern ten tribes, the northern called Israel. He is described in 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, where it says, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he thought that was trivial. And, and those sins were the golden calves, and he installed anybody that wanted to, to be priests instead of the Levites. But he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ezbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In worshiping Baal, they were burning babies alive. And in worship of Asherah, they were doing acts of open perversion. Things that are approved in today's culture. Elijah, during the reign of Ahab, Elijah the prophet challenged the prophets of Baal, as you know the stories. He defeated them with God's help. And he killed the prophets of Baal. And then Jezebel found out about it because they were her prophets. She imported them from Sidon. And by the way, Tyre and Sidon, if you don't know where that is, that's today's Lebanon, right north of Israel. Anyway, so Jezebel threatened to kill him, so he ran. So he's running away from a woman. He just killed 400 evil prophets, but he's running away from this evil woman, Jezebel. Pick it up in 1 Kings 19, chapter 9, or verse 9. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, God, stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great earthquake, a great and powerful wind, tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper in the King James, a still, small voice. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he repeated again, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back. Sometimes you have to go back. Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. There you will, there when you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram, which is today's Syria. Also anoint Yehu, or Jehu, however you want to pronounce it, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. In verse 15, go back. In order to achieve God's purposes, Elijah had to go back. Sometimes you need to go back. 
the entire nation of Israel sank into the horrible swamp of idolatry. Their idolatrous worship of Baal, they burned babies alive. In their idolatrous worship of Asher, they participated in open perversion. They could have returned to God. And probably a few of them did. But as a whole, they went their own way because they refused to go back to worshiping the one true God. Instead of idols, God allowed them to go into captivity. Second Kings chapter 18, the king of Assyria depart, deported Israel to Assyria and settled them in Hala, in Gozan, on the Haber River and in the towns of the Medes. This happened because they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but had violated his covenant. All that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, they neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. They refused to go back. They knew better. They knew what, what Moses had commanded. They knew, but they refused to go back. If they had gone back to God, they would have been spared. Sometimes you have to go back. In Judea, there was a good king named Hezekiah. He was the 13th king of Judah. After Ahaz's wicked reign, there was much work to do, and Hezekiah boldly cleaned house. Pagan altars, idols, and temples were destroyed. The bronze serpent that Moses had made in the desert in Numbers 21 was also destroyed because the people had made it an idol and they were burning incense, incense to it. The temple in Jerusalem whose doors had been nailed shut by Hezekiah's own father was cleaned out and reopened. The Levitical priesthood was reinstated and the Passover was reinstituted as a national holiday. Under Hezekiah's reforms, revival came to Judah. Hezekiah had witnessed the Assyrian captivity of the northern tribes. He knew that they went into captivity because they would not return or go back to God. His father was an evil king. Hezekiah took the nation back to, to proper worship. He was dedicated to God. The nation went back. Sometimes you have to go back. And Manasseh, Manasseh was a son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the best kings, one of the good kings, but Manasseh was one of the evil ones. Father to son to father to son. And he was 12 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hephzibah. This is in 2 Kings chapter 21. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab king of Israel had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshiped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. He built these idolatrous altars in the temple, in God's holy temple. Verse 5, in the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars for all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son. In the fire. And in 2 Chronicles, it says he sacrificed his own children more than just a son. He burned them in the fire. Manasseh did that. The son of Hezekiah. He practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. All satanic things. 
He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing God's anger. He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and put it in the temple, of which the Lord said to David and to his son Solomon in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. So Manasseh was captured by the Assyrian forces, the same country that took Israel away. They put a hook in his nose and led him into captivity. And in his distress, he repented. He was brought back to Jerusalem and restored as king. In his repentance, he went back to God. Sometimes you have to go back. He got rid, this is in 2 Chronicles 33, he got rid of the foreign gods and removed the image from the temple of the Lord, as well as all the altars he had built on the temple hill and in Jerusalem, and threw them out of the city. That's repentance. Because he was restored as king, and he was restored because he repented before God. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it and told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. He went back and he led Jerusalem back to God. Sometimes you have to go back. We live in a nation that doesn't care and refuses to listen to a message about God and about repentance. People want to decide for themselves what's best. People want to decide for themselves what's right and what's wrong. This is called situational ethics. They, want to con they don't want to conform to a standard of behavior. We need a set of unchanging standards against which to judge our actions and attitudes. And that's the Bible. We have that in Judeo-Christian ethical standards on which this country was built. Honoring God is first, love and respect for each other, don't kill, even the unborn, adultery, no sex outside of marriage, and that being between a man and a woman, no stealing, even if somebody has more than you. We live in a, condulture, a culture that condones all of those things, all of those things, murder, adultery, stealing, all those things are condoned in this culture. We have to have ethical standards based on the revealed will of God. <laughs> This culture wants to ignore God. They want to put God in a box. They want to compartmentalize. Call on him when we need him. Other than that, we'll decide for ourselves what's good and right and what is wrong. That's, what, that's where we are as a nation, as a culture. But God is not mocked. His patience only lasts so long. Disaster is coming. Only a great revival will save the nation. Will a nation repent? Only an individual repents. An individual repents. Millions can repent, and that can change the culture. Only God can cause a cultural change like that. And I believe it's happening that Sean Fate that goes around to capitals and to all over the place and tracks huge crowds, people that are coming to Christ. Things are happening on college campuses. We see in the news, you know, the bad stuff that's going on. The news isn't gonna show you good things. They don't like that because they're part of this evil culture that we live in. We do our part, so we need to pray for the nation like we did. Even the leaders that don't think like us, we need to pray for them. God can change their heart. Just like God changed Manasseh's heart. 
They claim they're not going back. It's a mantra. They change that. We're not going back. We're not going back. We need to make sure that our thoughts conform to God's will. Not to Marxism, not to socialism, but to the revealed will of our loving God. We need to go back. <laughs> the culture needs to go back. All the way back to God. Sometimes I have to go back to the cross. Sometimes I'm wandering off a little bit and I have to go back and re and revisualize my moment of salvation and go back. Sometimes I have to revisit that. You know, it was a vision at the crucifixion that brought me to Christ. I have to rekindle my love for the Savior sometimes. We get cold. We get cold hearted. And Joel said, rend your hearts, not your garments. Rend your hearts. That means tear your heart before God. Repent. If the people of God do that, that would be a spark. More people would do that. People are getting saved. But I don't know. You know, I don't know. Only God knows whether that's enough to stave off the disaster that's coming, judgment that's coming because of things that culture has decided to do in pushing God out. They started by pushing him out of the schools. They push him out of, out of the public. They take down the Ten Commandments. They don't want anything to do with traditional morality because they want to decide their own morality. We have to go back. And they chant a mantra, we're not going back, we're not going back. We have to go back. Disaster's coming. So that's what the nation needs to do is to go back. Sometimes I have to go back. Sometimes you have to go back. We all have to do that sometimes. Would you stand? I'm, a, I'm out of words now. <laughs> that means I'm done talking <laughs> Father God, we join our hearts together, once again asking for a change in this nation, a change that draws them toward you. Only you can do that, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We just pray for this nation, that, hoping that it's not too late. It's, not, it's never too late for us, Lord, who love you and believe in you, but we want the rest of them to come too. We don't know how much time is left on this planet, and we don't know what's going to happen in this culture. We know it's not going the right way. We know this culture is on a collision course with God. So Lord, we just pray and trust in you that you will help us to do our part in bringing people into the fold before it's too late. Thank you for all the believers in the house today. They are my friends, and I love every one of them, Lord, and you do too. So we ask you to just stir us up, Lord. Bring revival in each heart, personal revival, and let that spread to our neighbors and our families and workplaces, Lord. And bring them into the fold, Lord. We ask you to stay with each one of us and keep us safe until we come back again. In Jesus' name, amen. Bible study on Wednesday night at...